Welcome to Tales from the Waystone, a King Killer Chronicle reread podcast. We are your hosts, Will and Phoenix. Let's get into it. Welcome to Tales from the Waystone, Season 2, Episode 22, Burying the Hatchet, where we will be looking at Chapters 42 through 43 of The Wise Man's Fear through the lens of reconciliation. All right, by now, you know the drill. Each week we will be examining a section of The Wise Man's Fear through a chosen lens and figuring out what we can take from the text and apply to our real lives. We will also take some time to explore models of practical wisdoms from the text with an Aristotelian phronemos of the week. After that, we will expand our understanding of our own world with an interesting fact and share a recommended thing of the week. Finally, we'll wrap things up with seven words from the book and seven words from our own lives. Before we begin, let's get some disclaimers out of the way. First of all, we are in no way affiliated with Patrick Rothfuss or his publisher, Daw Books. Second, spoilers abound. This is a reread podcast. We assume that you have read the book we are reading. Or that you don't mind spoilers. Either way, the book we are reading is The Wise Man's Fear. We will probably also be spoiling things from The Name of the Wind possibly from the slow regard of silent things and possibly the lightning tree though that has yet to happen i think oh well anyway blanket spoiler warning also a word to our community please be kind to yourselves one another and the creators of the worlds we love exploring also don't kick people's slushies all right so now it's time for a 45 second recap it's my turn this week and so I hope you've got a timer ready. I actually have my phone this week. I don't have to borrow yours. I actually have it up. We are all completely ready. In three, two, one, go. With time on his hands, Quoth goes to visit Davy and hopes that she'll land on renegotiating for savings. After a long, cold, wet slog to arrive at her door, Quoth and Davy mend the hog and admit their mutual treatment was poor. While brooding at the end, Quoth receives a letter from Denna's own pen telling of how she's making her life better. She's staying in Yill and studying the harp. After adventures with sailor bills, her tongue has grown sharp. In Elodin's lessons, the teacher for once gives a damn, for fellows learn to address stone, and creates a ring so glam. She's called it eight times to the amazement of the boys, and has demonstrated a control fine, though she knows it's no toy. 31.20 seconds. No cherries for me. Very good. Although, you know... Christmas is in a week from when we've recorded this, and chocolate-covered cherries would be really good. Though we did miss the opportunity to inflict cherries on you from a gift we may have opened a little bit early, because it arrived on our doorstep, and it very clearly said, alcohol. Yeah, that was a no-go for me. The cherry? Yeah. Lemonade? Yeah. Fruit smoothie? Ale. Yeah, it, it was just not for me. Like, you took a whiff of that, and you're like, nope, 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 nope. And I had it, and I was very, very pleased with the fact that it was all for me. Good. I'm glad you were happy with it. I was. Anyway, so uh, let's go ahead and start in on Chapter 42, Penance. Is this the answer to the question? Yes. Penance? No, 42. <laughs> all right, carry on. We start off here, and Quoth is for once finding time to catch up on some of those obligations that he hasn't really been able to fulfill of late. You mean like sleeping? Among other things. So he's tried to pay a visit to Ari, but she's not going out in the snow and looks like access to the Underthing is both locked and iced over. Not that that's the sort of thing that would stop Quoth if he really wanted to. He's also been working some extra shifts in the Medica. And he's played an extra night in Anchors as apology for having to run out early on one of his nights. He's also been working in the fishery on his secret project. And perhaps most importantly, he's been catching up on some lost sleep. I do like, though, that it starts off with, since studying wasn't an option. Studying is an option. You have friends who probably took notes, even if you do not have money for paper. Also, you have friends who have brains that were in those classes that could help you remember things. Now, do I think that overstudying is a good idea? No, because I think that after a certain point, you're going to have diminishing returns. I also kind of think Quoth has reached that level where just doing more studying isn't actually helping his mentality. 
And so I think that this reprieve from that normal part of his routine is doing him some good here. So first of all, catching up on all of that missed sleep is really important. Let's not forget that he has been run ragged for the past several months. Absolutely. And that was my point, actually, is at this particular junction of his studying and university career, it really is more important to have a good night's rest. I know that the mentality of some people, especially when they're studying, especially when they're passionate about whatever they're studying, and when they feel pressure to do their best at everything, will quite often force themselves into crunch. But it's not healthy. They oftentimes interpret the expectations of what an A would be as being the thing that they have to achieve, where they've kind of forgotten that C's get degrees. And I made a point of always getting enough sleep. I mean, sometimes that didn't happen because I was too riled up after finishing an assignment that had to be turned in by midnight. And so I stayed up till two o'clock in the morning playing Skyrim. But I never once pulled an all-nighter because at a certain point you just cut bait and say this is good enough I've hit all the pieces of the rubric that I am going to hit and doing more is not going to help same thing with studying doing more generally at a certain point is not going to help pushing yourself and not sleeping is not going to help but on top of you know a lot of people who are very driven there are a lot of people who are very young at university and they have not yet learned how to balance that. This is also where he finally puts himself into a place where he can go talk to Davy and make amends because clearly their relationship has been broken both by his actions and by hers and they have needed to have some time to cool off to actually have a chance to do some healing. I think that's an important thing as well. Both prior to having this brief reprieve really was not in a place where he could actually have the conversation he needed to have. He wasn't in the place where he could be vulnerable and open about his emotions and his situation in a way that wasn't just going to be him lashing out. Especially with the plumb bob still stuck in his system, I think that at this point maybe he's using that as an excuse and what might be causing his irritability is that lack of sleep, is that overstudying, is that lack of tending to his mental and emotional needs. Exactly. So he decides he's going to go see her. Now, he's doing so in, it kind of feels like late January in Spokane. Oh, yeah, it really does. For context, for those of you who've never had that joy... Joy is an interesting choice of words. So it's typically you get a great big snow around Thanksgiving. And then it doesn't melt. Or it melts and then it refreezes into a crust. And then everything on the street just basically vacillates between being slushbergs and just slush. And so everything is cold and wet and gross. And dirty because Also, all of the cars, all of the grossness, everything just collects in the snow. Yeah, it's cold. It can be really miserable. And especially if you don't have a whole lot for insulation, if you don't have a good pair of boots. I mean, imagine going down the street, like even if the sidewalk is shoveled, right? Walking down a slushy street, it's cold enough to refreeze. You have poor insulation on, like you're wearing Converse. Let's just say you're wearing Converse shoes. Chuck Taylors, the original ones, like no Gore-Tex or anything like that. Just basic canvas chucks. And jeans. Oh, you are going to be miserable. Because the snow is going to collect on your pants and form a crust. And it's going to soak into your shoes almost instantly. And it will be cold and wet and miserable. And this is what I get the impression of Foth's journey to Emre. Yeah. So he stops into some of his old haunts. He stops by the Aeolian, I think, hoping to see a friendly face to gird himself with courage. Also, potentially to find a fire to dry off a little. (laughs) 
Unfortunately, the Aeolian is closed up tight because nobody's going to want to come out there, and you got to figure that their staff doesn't want to come in. You know, the streets are empty. And, I mean, this is what Spokane can be like during that time of year. This is, like, you know, mid to late January. There's not a whole lot going on. It's pretty sleepy. Most of the bars close early. The sky feels like it's shorter because of all of the steely gray clouds. You get a fair amount of fog. Frozen fog. And it's dark at like 2.30. It can be pretty gnarly and you're gonna feel yourself freezing like nobody's business. And Kvothe here, all he's got is just the one shirt, one pair of pants, and he's got his one pair of boots. He doesn't have a whole lot to keep him warm right now. He does have Fella's cloak. But even then, that's not an all-weather cloak. No, that's a fancy cloak. He loves that cloak, and it's an iconic thing for him, but he doesn't have something that's really good for keeping the rain off or the snow off. I mean, like, I love a good hoodie, but it's not good for that kind of weather. No, 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 no. Yeah, you need something that's going to have some sort of shell layer, whether that is something full leather or faux leather, as the case may be, or you want something that has Gore-Tex or, you know, something that's going to resist wind and rain. And that's really not what he's got right now. So he has to make do. So he finally arrives after this long, lonely, wet slog, which, you know, I can empathize with. And I kind of feel like Pat may be talking about some of his own experiences because he went to Eastern Washington University in WSU. So he's been in that cold Eastern Washington winter, and he knows what that feels like. Yeah, as bad as Spokane can be, Pullman is a little bit worse, actually. Yes. Yes, indeed. Especially when you're between terms and people have gone home. All the campus closes up, and a lot of the bars are a lot more empty. There's not much to do. It can be pretty sad. A college town, when everyone's gone home? Ugh. So, when he gets to Davy's door, she's initially kind of put out to see him. What are you doing here? Why are you this dumb? Finally, she has him come inside and, like, he's trying not to look too pathetic. Too late. And so for once, he's actually not trying to put on any airs or cop an exaggerated thing for the sake of emotional appeal. He literally has blue fingernails. And he's doing his best not to look at the fire. (laughs) And go, but, 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 but. And then that crust of slush just falls off of him. I know. I feel so bad for him here. Like, it's a tough position that he's in. I feel bad for Davy. Right. He's tracking all kinds of mud and grime and wet and ice into her home. Right. And that shirt melts. Ugh. We've actually had a situation where... One of our friends had given us a mattress and box spring that we were planning on using as a guest bed when we moved. And we had to keep it in our garage. And we forgot about one crucial thing after it snowed and we took the car out. The slush from the wheel well of your car melts and spreads. And we barely saved our poor mattress and box spring from the icky and disgusting. And then shortly thereafter, after putting it up on bricks to keep it from being directly on the ground, making sure that there was plastic covering it, everything of that nature. About a week later, one of our neighbors in the apartment complex, their water heater exploded. And then it started kind of raining in our garage. And somehow it missed the corner that the bed was in. Thank goodness. But I discovered this by going into the garage while you were away to have your interview in Oregon. And I had to go to the office at the apartment complex and just go, all right, so it's raining inside my garage. What do? It was not fun. No. But again, snow melts. Yes. Spreads. That's the point of my story. (laughs) So... Davy starts by saying, if you're trying to look pathetic, it's not working. And then, well, actually, it kind of is. I do like seeing you miserable like this. Yeah. Like, 
she thinks that he needs to have a comeuppance. I mean, kind of, but she is the source of a lot of his recent misery. Some of that known, some of it unknown, as we'll get to here. And he's also feeling, I think, humbled at this point. And that's really the key. Quoth, for so much of his academic career, is defined by pride. He's described as being proud as a kicked cat. And this is him for once being vulnerable, admitting fault, and being willing to accept the consequences of his choices. I think the thing that really defrosts Davy's mood towards him is when she says, so you thought you should just walk over here on the worst day of the year? Is that what your decision making was? And he responds, well, no, it was more I just felt like we really needed to talk to have a real honest conversation together. The bad weather was really just kind of incidental. The cherry on top of the shirt cake. And that, I think, helps her also understand that he is not coming to accuse her of anything, that he's not trying to weasel out of anything. He's coming to talk to her to mend fences, to actually express contrition and accept some responsibility. Besides that, he's planning on paying her back at least a little. As we'll see, she says no, but he's making a good faith effort. What we're seeing here is understanding that when you have a case where two people have wronged one another, oftentimes the best thing to do is start by admitting your own fault and apologizing for that. And then from there, it puts the other person in a position where they can take ownership of their own actions as well. And then that's where you can actually get to that true healing. He's taking the step here to open the door for Davy to also admit the ways that she's wronged him. He also, though, points out where she is culpable. He talks about how he was dosed with a plum bob and that he has ferreted out the fact that she's the one who sold, he assumes, the recipe for it. We later find out that she actually made it. Ugh. And he tries to explain, hey, this is where I was coming from. I had this crap in my system, for one thing, so I was making more rash decisions and more rash arguments than I normally would have, which is debatable. And you had my blood and I just jumped to the conclusion that it had to have been you providing it to Ambrose to make my life a living hell for the last, you know, month. He also points out that he was listening to what a lot of people were saying and maybe listening too much to that. And he admits that that was part of his mistake. With all the people telling him that Davy's dangerous, Davy's not a good person, Davy is out for herself and will screw you over in a heartbeat. So that admission that he had been wrong to make that con jump to that conclusion and that he also understands you know, what happened with the plumb bob and he kind of wants her to understand just how much he was hurt by that and what the effect was on him and how it's still affecting him. And Davy admits that yes, she did sell it. She didn't know that it was going to be given to Ambrose and that it was intended for Quoth. Doesn't make it any better. And I like that Quoth at least puts the stinger out there of, but you knew it was for someone. Right. That treatment could have been for anybody. And Davy was more or less okay with it. I mean, Davy may not be evil, but she's definitely not good. <laughs> And as we discussed previously in a previous episode, the university is very lacking on its ethics education. Exactly. The university teaches people to survive. It does not teach them how to be better people. Illustrated also by the fact that while Davy understands that, yeah, I probably shouldn't have done what I did, at least I didn't give over the formula and, you know, teach the man to fish. Right. That is a small mercy, a mitigating factor, but not necessarily exculpatory. But it also puts Davy in a place where she can admit that, yes, 
she wronged Kvothe, even if it was unintentionally. And then they also have that opportunity to bond over the set of books that the buyer used to purchase her services. And the two of them have a little bit of a chance to really express their mutual love for that sort of thing. They also had their chance to get back into their normal bantery routine. Finally, when all is said and done, Quoth makes the offer to pay this term's interest with three silver talents that he has, and Davy turns him down. Yeah, those three silver talents that he nicked off of Ambrose. Here is Davy showing a little bit of grace as well, knowing that Quoth is going to need that money to make it through the next couple weeks. The sad thing to me is that he just kind of uses all of it, or at least it's implied that he uses most of it. And so he's having to make the decision of the right now is way more important than the a few weeks into the future. Though I will also say that Quoth's purchases here represent a degree of wisdom. I agree with you. I'm not saying that if put in that position, I would necessarily have made a different choice. It's not like he's going out and getting something that is truly frivolous. He's not getting the equivalent of like Funko Pop figures when he doesn't have a warm shirt. So he uses that extra seed money to buy three new shirts, a new pair of pants, some thick woolen socks, as well as a hat, some gloves, a scarf, and then a few gifts for Ari. And just to recount what these are, because these will probably be important later. A pouch of sea salt, a sack of dried peas, two jars of peach preserves, and a pair of warm slippers, plus a miscellaneous supplies, so loot strings, ink, and six sheets of paper. So he's buying the things that he knows he's probably going to need. These are the things that will help get him through the winter and hopefully put himself into a position to thrive in the spring. There is one thing that he does purchase that, in theory, he probably could have built himself in the fishery, but he would have to explain himself a little bit, so he just, you know, buys it. Also, there is some wisdom here. He's not my friend Nemos, that is never the case, but there is some wisdom here in purchasing something that somebody else has crafted, even if you are capable of doing said crafting. I am capable of doing lots of crafting. I have supplies to do lots of crafting. I am also a big proponent of going to craft fairs and farmers markets and paying other people for having crafted the thing that, yes, I am technically able to do. Right, because Kvothe has finite time too. We know that Quoth, while clever, has lots of stuff on his plate right now. And while he could go to the fishery and make himself something, he probably would still have to pay for the materials on it since he wouldn't be selling it. So he wouldn't be making a profit on it. And he's got enough projects going on right now in the fishery, including his secret one, that, yeah... He's got plenty of stuff on his mind right now on his tray. He doesn't need to go to the business of making himself something new here. And so what he purchases is a sturdy brass drop bar that he can screw into the window frame of his tiny garret room. He could take care of like circumventing it pretty easily if he tried because he knows how it works. But it would keep my few possessions safe from even the most well-intentioned thieves. Denna. This is about Denna. He appreciates what she did for him, but my god, it caused so much anxiety that he doesn't want to deal with that crap again. Yeah, it's perfectly sensible. A little bit of basic home security for himself. I can understand it. He doesn't have much, so what he has he wants to protect. So moving on, let's talk about chapter 43 without word or warning. With Quoth at anchors, brooding over Denna's ring, when he receives a letter. Guess who it's from? Uh-huh. One of the things I find that's amusing here is that our letter carrier mistakes Quoth for the innkeeper. It's kind of a foreshadowing moment. 
And we've known that Kvothe does have a certain affinity for innkeepers. They have been people who have shown him kindness and hospitality pretty consistently. Usually, innkeepers are portrayed as folk that Kvothe is sympathetic to because they are taking people in out of the cold, giving them a hot meal. He's been on the receiving end of some charity from innkeepers in the past, and I can see how he might appreciate that. But apparently he has a proprietorial look to him. According to the letter carrier, Kvothe has a proprietorial air about him. And I can kind of see it. Kvothe is the sort of person who, when he feels comfortable in a place, starts to feel like he owns it. But it also shows that he still has that kind of ageless quality as a 17-ish year old. This is also another chance for Patrick Rothfuss to kind of dig at all the people who can't pronounce Kvothe. Kavothi. Kavothi. Uh, just Kvothe. So this letter bears an interesting crest on it, which is a stag rampant standing before a barrel and a harp. I'm curious whose sigil that actually is. So am I. I really want just a book of all of the back lore. Kind of like, I know that there are other publications for other long-running series where it's just illustrations of things like seals for the royals and what the clothing would be like and what Kvothe's loot would look like. And I want that art book. I want it so bad. That needs to be a project that Pat takes on and actually finishes. <laughs> when he cracks the seal, Kvothe reads this letter that Denna wrote, we don't know how long ago, just because it appears to have taken a fairly circuitous route to get here. Right. The most recent place it was picked up was Tarbian. And before that it was in Jinpui, and then before that, who knows? Well, at a certain point it was in Yil, because that is where Denna is, or at least was, when she wrote this. She mentions that she's pretty much run out of prospects in Imre, which I suspect have something to do with her falling out with Ambrose. He seems to be the sort of person who will leave a snotty Yelp review for everything. I mean... Yeah, I kind of figured burnt everything to the ground the same way that he did to Kvothe, except Kvothe is stubborn and stayed. Well, and also Kvothe has something else that he can stay for, which is to say the university. And at this point in his life, it's all he knows. So he's sticking around. So anyway, she's staying in Yill now, but meanwhile she had some adventures in the small kingdoms where she got to see two armored companies clash with one another. We also know that she got to meet an Adem mercenary, who I'm wondering if that mercenary is one that we will meet when Kvothe goes to Adem. Like I'm wondering if it's Veshet, or I wonder if it might be Pentha. Or Carceret even. Oh goodness, if it's Carceret that would, um, yeah. And she's also spent some time on a sailing vessel where she's learned a lot of knots as well as novel swear words. And we will see some of those knots appear in her hair. Then she closes by asking how his loot case is holding up. I think this is also another little bit of reconciliation. There's a part of Kvothe who feels wounded by Denna's absence. And this is her explaining where she is and that she's safe and that she still thinks of him. I like that she says, I think of you often and fondly. I can attest to the fact that when you are separated from someone, it is really easy to believe that they don't think about you, even if you think about them. It's really easy to think the worst of people. And my advice to those of us who kind of take the darkest path is to knock it off, damn it. Give people the grace to believe that they are actually thinking about you, even if you don't see any direct evidence of it. It's similar to advice that I have given other people. When other friends of mine have had something good happen, and they want to share it, and they are afraid to share it because they feel like no one wants to hear their good news. Because they don't want to be annoying, or make anyone feel like they're rubbing their good fortune in other people's faces. This is kind of the opposite problem to what social media curation can do. I've actually asked 
one of my friends who was very nervous about sharing some amazingly awesome news. I've asked them, but when I have good news, are you happy for me? Yes. Okay, then why do you think that if you have good news, I wouldn't be happy for you? And that stopped him in his tracks and made him think about it. Believe better of others, especially if you would be friends with that other person. Except that people will be happy to hear from you. And also understand that even if there may not be an easy way for them to directly show how much they're thinking about you, they most definitely are thinking about you. Like, during this pandemic, we have been kind of isolated. We moved away from where most of our friends are. We've moved away from friends multiple times, but we still have contact with a lot of them from Spokane, from Seattle. I have contact with some of my friends that I made in Medford. There are ways to keep in touch with people, even if all you do is send memes back and forth via text. That's kind of my primary way of communicating with some of my best friends now. It's a love language. So Kvothe gets this little bit of closure that he's needed. The mystery of where Denna is is, for now at least, solved. I want to know if you think that there's anything at all significant about the random amounts of capitalization in Denna's letter, or if you think it's just because she's drunk. I think it's because she's drunk and it's also a medieval era where proper spelling is not really something that's happened yet. Fair enough. So her tripping up over how you spell furtherance. Right. It sounds like she's a lot like me. So someone like Denna who doesn't have formal education really. She's clever and she's smart. She's obviously taught herself to write, but she's not necessarily going to understand certain formal things like capitalization and things like that. And honestly, it's not that important. We are assuming, though, that she is uneducated. We've inferred that. I think it's a reasonable inference based on what we know about her so far. So she's had to pick up a lot on her own. She is mostly self-taught in a lot of ways through hard lessons. That's the sort of thing that just happens, especially also if you're thinking, okay, I don't have oodles of free paper so I make a mistake, I'm just going to plow forward. <laughs> I'm not going to go back and try to fix it. You're writing in ink, you know? And then we get another reference in this letter about how Denna has asthma and how previous winters, when she spends it in places that get cold and damp, she essentially spends them in a sick bed. Yeah, there's something to be said for going to warmer climes there in the winter. And so then we move on to Elodin's class. And this is an unusual occurrence because Elodin's actually on time. <coughs> I love the note here about Elodin showing up in formal robes, but unlike when he is appearing in front of the council or with the other masters, here he actually looks like he means it. Like he's actually pressed them. They seem to be fitting. He's wearing them well. He's not being forced, therefore he's okay with it. I think there's something more to it. So I think Elodin is someone who truly is a teacher at heart. He just happens to be the teacher of a subject that is damnably difficult to actually teach. As such, when he wears the robes, it is out of duty. But when it's in front of the masters, when it's on the horns or whatever, and he's wearing the formal robes, that's an obligation. This is the actual duty, I think, that he feels truly called to, that he feels strongly motivated by, and that he genuinely loves. Because here he is to celebrate a student. It's his students that he cares about, not the pomp, not the circumstance, not the prestige of the masters or anything like that. It's seeing one of his students flourish. And celebrating and honoring that student. I think there's something really secret and wise there. And it's telling about Elodin's character, I think. Well, let's think about it. My preference for normal everyday clothing is very casual. Jeans and a t-shirt. My preference while I am working, jeans and a t-shirt. I do computer work. I don't have to 
have a customer facing anything ever. At least not with my physical appearance. Do I like to get out of the loungewear and out of the pajamas? Yes, because there is a different feeling between loungewear and pajamas, jeans and a t-shirt, and dressing up. I don't like to dress up very often, but I like to do it for special occasions. And if I do it for special occasions, there is a difference between something where I am obligated to do said special occasion, and I feel kind of like, oh, this is awful and I hate it. Why do I have to do this? And so I'll also choose to do things that are a little outside the norm or maybe not be pristine about it. But when it's something that I really truly enjoy and truly want to do, I will go all out, at least for me. You know, nice pants, pretty vest, button-up shirt, bow tie. Bow ties are not that easy to tie, especially around your own neck. It's like trying to tie your shoes with an extremely thick and short lace around your neck. But I enjoy the look, so I do it anyway. I also have pride in not getting a pre-tied bow tie. <laughs> I think that that's kind of where this comes down to. Elodin is proud of Fella. He is ecstatic that his student has learned the name of Stone. That's exactly it. This is where we learn where Elodin's true passion lies, and it is in the flourishing of his students. And it is something that he honors and delights in. So when he wears his formal robes for this occasion, it isn't an obligation. It is a way to show respect and love to his students because he believes they deserve it. And in this case, it's Fella specifically because Fella has had some really unique accomplishments here for she has mastered the name of Stone and called it eight times. That's pretty impressive. At this point, Quoth has only managed to call the wind once and couldn't repeat the trick if he tried. It's also something that Fella has really been keeping private. Even as everyone else has been griping, and she's been joining along with that, and even as everyone else has been jumping through all these hoops, and she has too, she's also been doing this extra work and this extra learning and has been keeping it to herself because this is something that I think she is doing for herself, not for prestige. You say everyone else has been jumping through all these hoops and doing all this work and everything. Not everybody. Quoth even admits, I wasn't really trying. I kind of gave up on all of this. So I want to share a little thing about one of my teachers that posted something on Facebook recently. It was an article about how a teacher had hidden money somewhere on campus, specifically so that if somebody in their class read the syllabus, they could go and just find it. And no one found it because no one read the syllabus. This teacher of mine has <laughs> made this particular gripe a few times. And then I find out that one of my other favorite teachers usually in their syllabus puts, if you come talk to me, I will give you a cookie. And out of 20 something odd students, he gave away like two. And then another teacher from my school also said, hey, yeah, in the syllabus, it says, if you talk to me or email me about this, you get five extra bonus points, nine people out of like 20 something. Read the dang syllabus, damn it. <laughs> that is my big piece of advice. The teachers have to go through and actually make this thing and plan everything that's going to happen throughout your entire semester. It's a lot of work. Give them the respect of reading it, dang it. It's like RTFM. Read the freaking manual. Forking manual. Fair enough. Here we also get the ceremonial element of all of this. As is part of the custom to demonstrate her mastery over this element, Fella now gets to wear a ring composed of it. That has an interesting implication for the wind. Indeed. How do you have a ring of wind? But Elodin gives her a river stone that she is to shape and mold using her mastery of its name. And so she starts by just staring very intently at it. Then Elodin says, don't look at it, look at it. Kind of reminds me of the discussion about Puppet from last time. 
little bit, yeah. So then we see Fella look very intently at it and then take it into her hands and then almost as if she's whispering a secret to it. We see her whisper something and then we hear, rather than see, this ring appear out of almost nothing. Left in her hand is a pile of dust and a very lovely stone ring. It's very intricate. And while initially Kvo thinks that it's smooth, it's actually not. It was covered in thousands of tiny flat facets. They circled each other in a subtle swirling pattern, unlike anything I'd ever seen before. The fact that she is able to have that fine of control, oh, the implications there. That's some deep power there. Like, that's some earthbender shirt. I think it also speaks to Fella's unbreaking will. It's something that is quiet and subtle, but it's unbreakable. And that's what defines her. Even as Kvoth is defined by the sort of mercurial nature of the wind, I think it really speaks to her personality, her steadiness, and I think also why she gravitates towards Sim. Well, with that, I think it's time for us to talk about our Fronimos, and it is my turn. You got some good choices this week. I do, and while I kind of wanted to choose Fella, we have chosen Fella a lot, and I think that she's worthy of it. I wanted to also throw a little bit of a curveball, because that's just how I do. So I am choosing the messenger person that brought Kvothe his letter. Okay. And there's a specific reason. Kvoth asks him what he thinks is fair as a price for both having paid for the letter because this mail system is really weird. Hey, I've got this letter that's going somewhere. Somebody pay me for it and then take it further. What? (laughs) There is no point to this. Why would you agree to take it partway somewhere? In the hopes that somebody on the other end of it will pay for it as well. I mean, there's no guarantee that you're going to go off your beaten path and where you're supposed to be going, and then the person, A, is findable, and B, is going to give you any money. Right. Like, what? Anyway, the reason that I chose this particular messenger, he did ask, how much would you pay for it? And Kvothe asks, how much do you think is fair? And instead of price gouging, he kind of undersells. And the reason that I am going to call him my Fronimos this time is specifically that he asks after making the negotiated deal, would you have paid me more? And Kvothe says, yeah, I probably would have. And he doesn't ask for more money. He just takes the loss and moves on. Right. He doesn't complain. He doesn't get mad. He's just like, oh. Crap. <laughs> Kind of. Like, oh, all right. Now, if both A had more money and B was a little less selfish, he probably would have paid a little bit extra for all of the trouble of getting this letter to him. Because the guy had to go from Tarbian to Emre when that was not the direction he was initially going to be going. Oh, well. (laughs) But I know that I have a problem figuring out what a fair price would be because I tend to undersell my value. I tend to also undersell the value of the things that I make. It's easy for me to say, well, I paid this much for all the materials and I don't really think that anyone wants to pay more than X amount. And it's something like, if I didn't want to pay more than X amount, then why would I expect anyone else to pay more than X amount? And then I just wind up circling myself down into my time is worthless, which isn't fair. And while he doesn't quite go into my time is worthless territory, he does undervalue his services. And then he kind of recalibrates. He also notices the air of that timeless adult-ish quality in Kvoth. And he's maybe not accurate about who the owner of the inn is, but Kvothe looks like he belongs there. And instead of looking at this kid and going, oh no, he goes, hey, you look like you could own an inn. And whether that's just buttering him up, trying to 
appeal to Kvothe's ego, which is never a bad choice, or whether that is legitimately you look like this could be your place. I think that that way of looking at things with that more positive attitude leads to a better outcome, no matter how incorrect the assumptions that are being made are. Kind of like anytime I ever had to ask for anyone's ID, yes, you have to ask, at least in grocery stores in the United States, you have to ask anyone that looks under 40 for their ID before they can buy alcohol. And the number of people that are close to 40 or over 40 that just go and say, thank you very much. I really appreciate you thinking that I look young enough where I wouldn't be able to buy my alcohol. That makes me feel so good. Now, they don't always know that you're looking for someone who looks under 40. They assume that you're looking for someone who looks under 21, but it makes them feel good. And making someone feel good generally leads to a better outcome when you're asking them for something like money. Indeed. So good choice. Thank you. So it's my turn then to take to heart the lessons of Master Elodin, and we're going to talk about interesting facts. Kind of. This week we're going to be talking about universal expansion. So historically, our observations of universal expansion have estimated the universe's age at approximately 13.8 billion years. However, a new set of observations from the Hubble Space Telescope places that age at closer to 13 billion years. So minus that 0.8 billion. That's a lot, actually. That is a lot. That's not just a rounding error. So while that discrepancy seems relatively small, it places cosmologists and astronomers in a place of unusual tension. So the original model was based on observations of supernova and Cepheid pulsars through the Planck Observatory Terrestrial Telescope, while these new observations come from Hubble's orbital platform. Scientists have gone through all manner of potential mitigating factors, whether it was weather at the time of the initial observations or there's something weird going on with the optics, all kinds of stuff. Like they have tried to factor out everything and nothing so far has been able to explain this discrepancy, which is an unusual place to be. Now, to be fair, this tension is baked into the scientific method. Scientists evaluate theoretical models based on their ability to explain and successfully predict outcomes. And when they encounter a deviation so significant, it means one of two things. So either A, there was a complicating factor in one or both sets of observations that wasn't taken into account, or B, there is a previously unknown missing ingredient at work in the universe whose existence scientists are only able to infer at the moment. In this case, they've been unable to find any complicating factors that could alter the observed rate of expansion to the degree their data seems to indicate, which implies some manner of dark energy that may be in play, accelerating the rate at which our universe expands. They call it dark energy not because of the absence of light or anything like that, but because they've been unable to observe its properties directly and have only been able to make inferences about it based on their indirect observations of how it might be affecting other celestial bodies. So that's just something that's really fascinating to me. These are people who are some of the top of their game and they understand that it's natural for models to be broken. And that while they talk about it as a crisis in cosmology, really what it means is that this is an inflection point where they are at a point where they have to either revise or completely discard the old model and no one is really sure which way they're going to go. Everyone is really fascinated by what this could mean. There's a lot of curiosity about it. And this is just one of those reminders that it's okay to be wrong. In fact, it's expected that you're going to be wrong a fair amount of the time. And that's part of the point. And discovering those places where you're wrong is just as important as these grand eureka ideas. It also leads to a whole lot of unusual things where we don't know what's happening. This is where scientists actually kind of love to live. This is the stuff that justifies their research. This is the stuff that reminds them of just how little we actually know about our universe. This is why we do the research. It's not because of the stuff we know, it's because of the stuff we don't know. And I think that's just a really fascinating way to view the universe knowing that we're going to make mistakes, we're going to have things wrong, and we're going to 
discover new things. We can only discover new things if we've been wrong about things in the past. One thing I also like is that it implies that iteration is not only acceptable, but it is the right way to go about things. Right. It's expected. Like, this is, this is the way the system is set up to work. Like, the scientific method isn't a body of knowledge. It's a framework of understanding. And it's about how we get knowledge as much as what we know specifically. It's as much an epistemic practice as it is a rote memorization practice. Having a loose hold of what you understand versus a tight hold of what you think you understand. So many people get defensive over their body of knowledge as if any challenge to that is a challenge to them. If any different data comes across, it's somehow an affront. But I would challenge people to be open to failure being an option. I would challenge people to not get defensive when someone challenges your belief system or the knowledge you have held for however long you've held it. If a better theory, if a better knowledge base, if more information comes to light, grow, learn, accept, hold loosely. I think part of it is also that like our dichotomies of scientists are people like Edison and Tesla or Leibniz and Newton, who are these brilliant minds who are locked in sort of this duel of egos and competing theories or what have you. And for every one of those things where the scientific became personal, those really represent the exceptions as opposed to the rule. And when you see people in the scientific community challenging a very wild claim, they're doing so knowing because that is their job. They have to challenge the claim so that people can see if it stands up. They aren't just trying to be people who are going to lock Galileo in a leaning tower or whatever. This is literally them testing ideas rigorously. And when ideas don't hold up, unpopularity is not proof. It just means that it didn't actually hold up in any meaningful fashion. The scientific method as it exists now is far more refined than it was in the Middle Ages. And it's far more refined than it was during the British Enlightenment. I could go on for a long time about Leibniz and Newton, because honestly, Newton, as much as he was a genius, was also a right twat. So, yeah. That doesn't need to be bleeped, because no. we're not... We're not British. Okay. If there are any children listening, just pretend that he didn't say that word. If you don't know what the word is, cool. Newton was a jerk. Let's put it that way. And he also misinterpreted Leibniz's stuff in the most catastrophizing way possible. Moving on. <laughs> All right, moving on. Yes. So that was my fact of the week. Thank you. So I believe it is your turn for thing of the week. It is. My recommendation is that everyone go and check out a recording of Pat reading the prologue to Doors of Stone. Presumably, if you're listening to us talk about The Wise Man's Fear, that means that you have read through all of it and you, like us, are eagerly awaiting the next book. Remember that you are passionate and excited and happy and don't let time sour that excitement. And please don't kick people in the slushy. Watch the recording and you might understand why I said that again. But for one thing, I really like hearing Pat's reading voice. If you want more of it, just listen to the audiobook of The Silver Guard of Silent Things. The cadence is so relaxing that I can kind of let my mind go into a state where that book makes more sense, where Ari's thought process makes more sense. But just listening to Pat read the prologue, whether or not that's the prologue we get in the final version, but listening to him read it is just peaceful and loving and kind. And the whole hour of recording, he answers some questions beforehand. He's trying to make sure that as many people as can possibly be around to hear the prologue are on the stream before he starts. And 
he came up with a wonderful new shirt idea and I really need a shirt that says don't kick me in the slushy. I'd love that to be illustrated by Nate Taylor. I can imagine what it would look like. So can I. Or don't kick Pat in the slushy. Come on. Don't kick anyone in the slushy. Absolutely. But that's my recommendation. Go check out. There's a whole host of people who have put this up on YouTube. It was originally on Twitch. I think it's archived on Twitch. I don't use Twitch very often, but it is what it is. And it's mostly, from what I understand, a way to watch a whole bunch of people play video games. Among other things, yeah. But that sounds delightful. And if I wasn't using a lot of my time and attention that I could focus on computer stuff, on editing this, I might watch more Twitch stuff, but I don't. So anyway, it is my recommendation that you go and listen to him read it. Also, there are a few people that have transcribed it. So if you really, really, really feel like you need to read it, you could probably find someone on Instagram or Facebook or something that has shared it or read it. But yeah. It got me excited. It reminded me of how that first prologue really pulled us all in. And it has similar cadences. It has similar hints and foreshadowing without really revealing anything. It's there to draw us in and it reminds us of why we fell in love with this world in the first place. Why we're doing this podcast. So yeah, I agree with that recommendation. Thank you. So now it's time for our seven words. You have the books this week. What'd you pick? So I had a fair number of choices. I'm still not exactly sure what one I wanted to use officially. Let me read a few off. You never do things the easy way. The weather was just a happy accident. It's better than handing over the formula. Davy snorted indelicately and rolled her eyes. How much do you think is fair? I think of you often and fondly. Namers walked these streets like tiny gods. My efforts had been half-hearted at best. Still grinning, Elodin held out his hand. And don't look at it. Look at it. Do you think that last one, maybe? I think that last one. Okay. Good call. Thank you. So I had seven words from life, and this is from you, said to a mutual friend of ours. Ooh, that's a lovely set of Lego. <laughs> For context, our friend got their son the gingerbread house Lego set for this year as a Christmas present. And he got to open it a little early. And they sent a picture and I knew exactly what set it was, even without really seeing the set in the photo. It's kind of at an angle with like a glare coming off of it, but I knew what it was. And I think it's wonderful and perfect. I can't wait for when we can have like a little Lego Christmas village set up in one of our rooms. It has to be in a place that the cats can't get to. Sokka would destroy anything that we tried to build. <sighs> little trouble muffin. The thing about it is like, I am aware enough of what the current sets are. I am aware enough of all of these lovely things that Lego has come out with. We are in a room full of it. And it's one of those things that brings me comfort because my dad used to very patiently when I was six years old or younger, explain how the instructions wanted you to build things. And having watched a different one of our friends work with their child on building things based on the instructions, parents who help their young children with Lego sets have the patience of saints. And it just brings that joy and comfort back. Aw. You do know your Lego. I do know my Lego. One of many things I love about you. Thank you. With that, I would love to thank you for potting with me. Thank you for potting with me. And thank you for listening to Tales from the Waystone. Join us next time on Tales from the Waystone as we cover chapters 44 through 46 of The Wise Man's Fear through the lens of narrative discipline.
We would like to thank our friend Shawnee Jang for our theme music. And many thanks to Patrick Rothfuss for creating a world that we've enjoyed exploring. Audio production, editing, and social media coordination, courtesy of me, Phoenix McCullough. And project management and writing, courtesy of me, Will McCullough. If you would like to help support us and have the means to do so, please consider becoming a patron on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash waystonepod, where you can get access to our show notes, early access to the pod, special bonus pods. Right now we're doing a whole series on the Sandman, and hopefully you heard our little snippet a couple weeks back. We also have posters and other artwork and potentially other peers should anyone have a good suggestion of what we can offer. And with that, here's to one more day above the roses. To one more day above the roses. Ding! Ding. Right. I mean, because he buys three pairs of shirts, a new pair of pants. Some three pairs of shirts? Three pairs of shirts. Or three shirts. So let's go back. <laughs> three pairs of shirts. Yeah. So he uses this extra seed money to buy three new shirts, a pair of pants, some thick woolen socks, which are worth their weight in gold, if not more, plus some hat. Or some hat? <laughs> plus a hat, some gloves, a scarf. I'm sorry. I had to start over that because I some hat and a glove. <laughs> Some hat. Pairs of shirts and hats. You done? Nope. <laughs> I'll try to be done now. So he uses that extra seed money to buy some... Th no. Stop. <laughs> Stop! <laughs> Foot.